Today, I'm speaking with Blair Christie, Chief Marketing Officer at Cisco. Please join me for this two-part interview on this episode of Substance. It is such a pleasure to have you here on Substance. Thank you so much, Blair, for being Thank here. Yeah, Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. It's funny the way this actually came together. You mm -hmm. came as a recommendation from some mutual friends. Yes, I understand um, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So, it's yeah. been a great company, wow, what you do. I've been watching it for a while, and so it's kind of a privilege on my end, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, um, you know, so we wanted to have you on. I wanted to have you on because you are so vibrant in what you do, and you're so out there in terms of setting the potential and future for what, you know, again, with the, with Cisco and, mm -hmm. and, and the company that you're with, but some of the things that you're doing right now and how you're changing, you know, the way people look at technology and the backbone of the internet and the sure. internet of everything and all that kind of stuff. I want to get to all of that. Okay. But first, tell me about your family. <laughs> Wow. Okay. No, so before we start, on before all we that. start, so talk about family. Well, I've been married for about 23, 22 years uh, with my husband. About that long. We have, a, let's see, an 11-year-old daughter, an 8-year-old mm. daughter, and a 4-year-old son, and we keep ourselves very, very busy. That like, has to keep you busy. It is, you know, whether it's a sports event or a birthday party. I think we had three birthday parties alone. It seems like every kid is born in May, just so we're clear. Oh, uh, yeah, right. I don't know what happened 10 months before May, but yeah. it's a very busy mm. time. Um, but uh, we moved to the California area, gosh, about 15 years ago. We're both from, my husband and I are both from the East Coast. And uh, we promised our family we'd be out here for just a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And here we are 15 years later and three kids later. Yeah, I've heard that before. Yes. It seems to suck you in and never let you go. Well, there's certainly a lifestyle here. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, when you can go to the mountains and ski in the snow one weekend and right. go to the beach and enjoy yourself there another weekend, yeah. it gets pretty compelling, and, especially after the winter that East Coast just had. I know it, tough, yeah. it was tough. Mm -hmm. Do you get um, do you get the, a chance to go see your family? Or are you are you guys family oriented? Sure, absolutely. So I'm uh, the oldest of two, so we're very tight knit. Oh. My husband's the youngest of seven, so and he's the only one that doesn't live within a thirty mile radius. So we go back a lot. You know, in this day and age, you can keep in touch with yeah. all of social media, all the different ways to do both FaceTime or Skype, or mm -hmm. obviously, you know, Cisco sells quite a bit of collaboration video uh, conferencing that I do a lot with my family. But we travel back there, right? It's an opportunity to get to New York yeah. when I work with investors. Uh, we have quite a bit of customers in the DC area, so it's a real. It makes it pretty easy to to merge your life and and your uh, personal life at the same time. So what in your past do you think kind of highlights the an area for you that set you up for success? What what things or thing mm -hmm. made you who you are today? Who I am today? Yeah. How long do we have? We've got um, About 60 hour? minutes. Yeah, if, okay. you know, so if you want, <laughs> we can go 90 minutes. You know, we're going to go 90 minutes. <laughs> okay, because I could fill that bucket. <laughs> so, so thinking back on where... How, what's really brought me to where I am today? There's a, a few things. Probably the most significant for me was I had a pretty amazing robot model in my own mom. Um, my uh, parents were married for about 20, 25 years, and she was all that you'd expect from a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. And when they divorced, uh, she went back to work, and she was above expectations as a very successful business leader. So I saw both sides. Mm -hmm. And in that, um, there was quite a bit of inspiration that she instilled in us, self-confidence, mm -hmm. a focus, a work ethic, an incredible work ethic. Um, and so that had a huge impact on me. And so when I chose the university that I would go to, I went to a school that had a very robust co-op program where you would work six months and go to school six months. It was Drexel University mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Um, not only did that work out for me by having a business suit and a resume at 19, um, it's also where I met my husband, so oh, cool. it was good all around. But it was really powerful because it gave me a chance to go into the workforce at a younger age, um, understand what I wanted to do, but even more importantly, what I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of exposure before I graduated. Mm -hmm. And fortunate uh, for me, I um, started working for a very dynamic business leader in Philadelphia. And I followed him when he became CEO of a local utility. 
and um, he gave me tremendous opportunity, mm -hmm. well beyond probably what I deserved at a young age, and it just gave me a real launching pad. Mm -hmm. And from that, between the role model of my mom watching this leader mm -hmm. do what he did, uh, it really put me into the world of investor relations, mm -hmm. which I never would have known about, mm -hmm. and really into the broader opportunity that I've uh, been able to have at Cisco. What was one thing that you learned from him? That, from him? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the most interesting things I learned from this leader, he was very uh, uh, astute in politics. Mm -hmm. When you work for a utility, you need to be very, very connected to local government because rates of return are set by a utility commission, and it's a very important part of how you set your strategy and your funding mm -hmm. uh, as a utility. Um, and he was the master at building relationships. I mean the master. I would write thank you mm -hmm. notes for him on his behalf. I got very good at signing his name. But he would write a thank you note to everyone who participated in maybe a fundraising event or a meeting or anything that he did. He went out of his way to build wow. a network. And from those relationships, um, he was able to navigate and influence so smoothly. And without a doubt, mm. uh, that was the secret to his success. And I got to see that on the front end and the back end. And wow. of course, tried to emulate that over time. Although my thank you note writing days have definitely gone down. It's now about an email or a really nice uh, yeah. uh, text. But Yeah, or I got a tweet from you earlier like, well, today. There we that go. was very nice. I was looking forward to being here. <laughs> you were on my mind. You were thank on you. my mind. Thank you. So that's interesting because the relationship mm -hmm. driven era. Right. Um, and you could say that that hasn't ended, but it has started to become a little bit harder. Yes. A little, little bit more challenging, yes. with, especially with technology. It's Absolutely. It's just so much easier for us to you know, have a less of a relationship and more of a, of a superficial. You know, yeah. No, yeah. I agree. Well, what I learned from this um, particular leader who, by the way, is still the leader and still an incredibly uh, respected business leader, I would say up and down the mid Atlantic on the East coast is that uh, it's not, one is the network. So the network is where you can leverage every tool imaginable, right? Knowing who to call, when to call, being able to connect people like our mm -hmm. uh, friends in common have connected you and I. But then there's relationship, and that's a little bit different. And, you know, relationships today require the same amount of energy they always have, mm -hmm. um, and you just ha can't take it for granted, mm -hmm. right? Depth is as important as breadth, and mm -hmm. that's something that um, even in our busy lives, you know, it really hasn't changed, but you probably need to prioritize it mm -hmm. a little bit more, whether you're dealing with your customers or your team or your family, which mm -hmm. is a great example, right? Really going deep in the relationship, mm -hmm. um, regardless of how broad it is, you know, still has the biggest impact. And one thing that I know you're also getting involved with, mm -hmm. with is uh, STEM. Yes. And that obviously plays a huge part, especially with your own kids yes. and where the future mm -hmm. of tech, you know, technology is going and sure. these kinds of things. Can you explain a little bit sure. more about that? Sure. Well, I always, uh, I, whenever I talk with people on my team or anyone who's looking for career advice or uh, making decisions, I always uh, try to remind them that there's your professional agenda and your professional aspirations. There's your personal agenda, personal aspirations. But the real sweet spot is when you can find an opportunity where to bring those together. And so when I look at Cisco, I look at the technology industry, um, I also look in my personal life where my husband is a teacher. It's an area that we're very passionate about where we spend our own personal time. You know, it's a great intersection uh, to come together where you can use a platform like Cisco uh, to really take your, your authentic passion and, mm -hmm. and drive it. You know, when it comes to Cisco, you know, we simply have one problem and that is pipeline. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough people to fill the jobs that we need today and into the future. So you have over 70,000 employees yeah. and you don't have enough people. Absolutely, we cannot fill the positions that we need, STEM positions, wow. right? Science, technology, engineering, and math at the rate that we need to. That's why um, immigration is a very important topic to companies like Cisco because we need to be able to bring qualified candidates in. Mm -hmm. Today alone in the US, there's almost a quarter of a million uh, gap in qualified candidates for jobs. So more jobs than qualified candidates, which is not what you'd expect when you look at unemployment. Right. Um, you know, the number of women who received computer science degrees actually peaked in the mid 80s mm. at 37%. Today, it's around 20%. Wow. So there's this decline. So whether it's um, 
you know, uh, a focus on a particular pool or population going into STEM or just trying to create a larger pool of STEM qualified candidates in general, incredibly important to mm -hmm. Cisco. So I've gotten very involved there. It's also important to me as I look at my two daughters going mm -hmm. into STEM and making sure that they understand what will make them, you know, what are the jobs of the future and mm -hmm. sort of where their passions are. They're both Lego enthusiasts. Mm. Do you know how many girls are in Lego camps? <laughs> I right? have no idea. I, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's about five percent of the of the wow. pool are, are girls. So it kind of yeah. they need they need a focus. One of the things that we've done at Cisco, uh, we've we partnered with a number of great organizations. One is called US 2020, and that is an effort that is being backed by uh, the White House administration today. And it's pretty simple. We're trying to get you know 20 million uh, STEM. Uh, uh, mentors into the environments where kids are, youth organizations, schools, and others by 2020. Uh -huh. Because the idea of the I role like model is significant. And if girls, if uh, any kid can see themselves reflected in an opportunity and learn about it in the mm -hmm. middle school uh, uh, age, you can see a huge impact and it can keep them on track. So we have over 70,000 employees. Mm -hmm. If you take 20% of our employees doing mm -hmm. 20 hours uh, over the course of time, you know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands wow. of volunteer hours. And so we're really engaged with that. A number of companies are. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, I'm pretty certain it's going to rise a tide mm -hmm. that all boats will then mm -hmm. benefit from over time. One of the things I know now you have with your own kids as you're looking towards the future, mm -hmm. we were just ta talking before about thank you notes. And right. now we're talking about STEM. Yes. Um, what, what will you be teaching your own children? And how does that fit into what you're talking about here? Well, I think the... For us as parents, yeah. you're always trying to instill a value system um, that you know over time uh, will be constant, mm -hmm. but how it manifests itself changes, right? Mm -hmm. So is it okay for my daughter to write a thank you note over email to her friend for the birthday present, or do I feel like she has to write it right. down? Um, at the yeah. end of the day, it's the spirit of mm -hmm. gratitude and appreciation, and however that comes about, yeah. well, we're, my grandmother might roll over. That's the way that you do it going forward. Yeah. So when it comes to <laughs> STEM and trying to get our kids focused, and whether they're girls or whether they're coming from maybe low-income areas that don't have as much exposure, or whether they're the just general boy population, what you need yeah. is to get them enthused mm -hmm. and give them a vision of what the opportunities are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we're trying to drive with our uh, school district, right? Get them exposed and ensure that there are science-based activities that they can mm -hmm. engage in. What's an example of how you would get, engage sure. them? So um, a lot of electives these days, kids have electives, even in middle school. You can mm -hmm. do dance, you could do art, mm -hmm. you could do science in action, mm -hmm. right? I talk about Lego camps, getting mm -hmm. that into the schools where children can see how much they enjoy building and creating, mm -hmm. and then tying that to a much bigger opportunity, right? right? I have uh, seen a couple of uh, projects where my daughter has done where she had no idea putting a few battery together with some pens and with some, you know, cardboard yeah. could turn into a robot, right? I mean, that's pretty powerful. And yeah. so you start capturing their imagination, but you put, you give them exposure opportunities to harness that. It's what some of the mentors do. They come and they talk about what they're doing, but they put it into action, mm -hmm. right? It's different than just reading it in the book and memorizing, which was how I was taught. Mm -hmm. It's really in action. And those are the types of things that we're trying to really create and curate, frankly, for that uh, age group. It's interesting that, you know, we're, we're in a world that's very digital mm -hmm. and we're talking about a physical action. I know. Well, think about what you remember. Right? How many people talk about, well, if I write it down, I'll mm -hmm. remember it, but if I read it, I might not retain it. Right. Or think about what happens when you do something in action. I think about it with our teams. We'll do PowerPoint after PowerPoint of how things are going to work and what we're going to say mm -hmm. and how we're going to operate and what the results are and what's the dashboard for su success. Right. And then you turn around and give it to your team to do it. Yeah. And everybody's like, this doesn't work. So I think you know one of the uh, mottos at the school I went to, Drexel University, was just do it, right? Just yeah. like Nike, right. right? We talked about the power of DUing, right? Doing, and that was what the co-op was all about. So I, I think there's something there mm -hmm. that we have to do a balance. The good thing for kids today is they can get more information mm. in a more quick um, way than we ever could before. Mm -hmm. So what that should do, if you bring them together, is accelerate. What do you think? Um, you and I remember a time when there was no internet. Yes. Right? There yes. was no device. What did we do with our time? I don't remember. I think we built forts. <laughs> <laughs> I think we climbed trees. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. that We would play outside. Mm -hmm. And 
that's becoming a challenge. People, mm -hmm. the ki kids, my yep. my kids on uh, Minecraft. Yes. All yes. The big time. fans, big fans. Yeah. So, yes. is that how how do we how do we maintain playfulness sure. and um, and still you know yeah. childhood spark their mind? Yeah. Well, you know, certainly we need to work a little bit harder yeah. at the balance. It's probably pretty easy to let your kids work on something on an iPad, and two hours later you realize, well, they're not watching TV, but they're still on a screen. Right. You know, uh, just like I talk about with values, right? Yeah. There's a core set of experiences and exposure mm -hmm. and just things we know are right mm -hmm. as parents, as human beings. Uh, vitamin D and getting outside exercise is is good, and mm -hmm. that's always been and it always will be. Mm -hmm. I, I really think it's balance. Yeah. And I do think you have to be um, cognizant and aware of the type of environment you're setting, whether it's for your team or whether for your kids. Mm -hmm. You can't just let it happen. Yeah. You know, there's a little more uh, focus, I think, is what's important. But both are good, mm -hmm. right? Get them to do Minecraft and then get them to go outside and actually build something. Right. A kid down the street the other day built a go-kart. A go-kart. When was the last time you saw that or something that we did as we were growing up? Right. So it, was, uh, it probably drew 25 kids from the neighborhood to get down there and to look at. Now they all want to do something like that. And do it together. Role model, right? Yeah. So yeah, basic principles that haven't changed. It probably just takes a little more forethought given all the opportunities for kids and for us as adults mm -hmm. to consume information and to do stuff today. So that's a good lead in into mm -hmm. the internet of everything. Everything, or yes. the internet of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of people building uh, go-karts. Sure. <laughs> and they're trying to build go-karts that are connected. Yep. Um, where, where, how far do you think this will go mm -hmm. before the robots take over? <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I don't think the robots are ever going to take over. Yes. I think we're always going to be a few steps ahead. First of all, the internet of everything is really very simply the next wave of the internet. It's how Cisco describes it, other companies, Gartner, uh, describe it. And for us, the internet of everything is when you take a combination of people, process, data and things and bring them all together and connect them mm -hmm. in a way that we haven't before. Mm -hmm. uh, so it feels like we're all connected, but in reality, uh, we're only, we've only just begun. Less than 1% of the world mm. is actually connected to the internet. So today, less mm. than 2 billion people. By 2020, we're gonna see uh, close to 5 billion people connected to the internet. Today, there's about 20 to 25 billion things connected to the internet. By 2020, 50 billion things will wow. be connected. That's Remarkable. Mind-boggling. Right. And so you're going to have machine-to-machine -machine or things-to-things mm -hmm. doing a lot of interaction, which is what we call the Internet of Things today. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're also going to have uh, machine-to-people or people-to-machine or mm -hmm. people-to-people connecting and also creating more value in that connection than you've ever had before. Mm -hmm. So um, you look at Etsy. That is a huge value creation from people connecting. Did not have that before. Mm -hmm. Though another, I don't know, you know, billion artisans into Etsy, and that is going to be a marketplace that Amazon's going to have to worry about. That's value. It has nothing to do with things, by the mm -hmm. way. It's bringing them. So the internet of everything in our mind is much more broad than that. Mm -hmm. We love it at Cisco because the power of the network mm -hmm. is the number of nodes squared. Mm -hmm. And when all of those things connect, the, the power and the role of the network uh, grows. But everyone has an opportunity to gain. So the Internet of Everything is that next wave of the Internet. The Internet of Things mm -hmm. is what's here today, mm -hmm. and that's an important market that is building that. So whether it's wearables, mm -hmm. right, you see people wearing them on their wrists, mm -hmm. wearing them, there you go, yeah. wearing them on their um, waist, you see clothing. Um, you know, I've noticed, you know, the, the amount of clothing going into just what the NBA is trying to do mm -hmm. to get vitals as their players are playing basketballs, mm -hmm. right, to continue the I NBA. I just saw socks yesterday. Absolutely. And embedded chips so that you can match your socks straight up out of the dryer. Oh my gosh. That would solve like, the, <laughs> the age old problem of where the other socks went. I can't wait to find them all. Um, I'll send you the link. Okay, well, so there you go, right? The Internet of Things. Um, in our world, we're seeing manufacturing doing some amazing new value creation because they're connecting things on their manufacturing floor, which they never connected before. Just think about the fact that uh, in hospitals, there's multiple protocols from your 
CT scan to your x-ray to your people uh, or uh, patient resource management. Connecting all of those things that go mm -hmm. in, you're going to have hopefully a much greater outcome and a much more preventative sort of healthcare industry. So that said, Internet of Things is mm -hmm. here today. It's a world we participate in. Many of our technology peers are mm -hmm. participating in. Um, but you got to take it beyond just the things because that's mm -hmm. where the real opportunity lies. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about being connected mm -hmm. and being in a connected society. How does that... Um, how do you see that playing out from a from a more uh, national or even an international perspective down to a more local level? Right. I mean, because that really spans. I sure. mean, the internet of everything is sure everything. Sure, it is everything. We've done a bit of research here, trying to understand where you're going to see this really take off. What opportunities are there today? We've done it globally. We've also done it by industry, mm -hmm. right? Because you know industries are very unique. Healthcare versus education versus retail versus financial or even public sector. They all have their unique needs. And they're all in different stages. So first, if you take it global, what's so powerful about the internet of everything is that the value can be created much more quickly. So the barriers to entry are gonna come down mm. and you're gonna see developing countries leapfrog the developed countries, so that's pretty powerful. Really? Yes, you look at some of the investment going into Brazil, let's just use Brazil as an example, two massive world events coming where they're gonna be the stage for FIFA and the World Cup, mm. and then the 2016 Rio Olympics. Mm -hmm. The amount of infrastructure that they're putting in, the amount of connectedness mm -hmm. that they're going to create, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's backbones to carry the streaming video, all of that is just gonna put them so far ahead, mm. and you know they're gonna use that mm -hmm. once all the teams go home and the fans go home and you mm -hmm. pack up a successful Olympics. It has a huge accelerator for their economy mm -hmm. and for their populations. So you're, what we're learning is that the value is gonna be created um, almost equally around the world. Mm -hmm. There are some countries who are farther ahead, maybe like a China or a US mm -hmm. or others, but it's not gonna take a long time to mm. quickly. So for industry, it means you can create value just about anywhere. Mm -hmm. On the personal level, we're gonna to have to really think hard and reflect on the risk reward mm -hmm. of information sharing, right? Because mm -hmm. I can guarantee you, you know, 10 years ago, uh, not everyone would put their credit card on the internet. Mm -hmm. Today we do, because the reward has been outweighed, um, has outweighed the risk. Right. You know, going forward, we're gonna get more reward by sharing information, let's say, from our car to our insurance company mm -hmm. that feels like a privacy invasion today, mm -hmm. but over time could save me 50, 60% of my insurance right. rates. So there's a reward risk imbalance, but that's going to soon change. So that's a human thing. Mm -hmm. We're all having a hard time with yes. privacy. Right, we're, yes, we're, we're, we're wearing these so. things and it's connecting. Right. And we're wondering, wait, if I'm wearing glasses or if I'm wearing sure. something that's connected, mm -hmm. I'm handing myself over to. Right. Now, I tend to be a geek, so I'm like, hey, so you're bring well, it on. You're really I, comfortable. I, I, let's, what do I have to lose? Right, you live your life authentically. Take? So, yeah, yeah. got but it. But I don't think that everyone's that way. Sure. And, and I think it's the majority that probably thinks, you know, if I hand my credit card over the same way I hand my glasses or my Fitbit mm -hmm. or my whatever over, mm -hmm. what is it that I'm handing off? And how, how are people going to get... Is, is it, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the world is becoming a smaller and smaller place yeah. forever. And um, that's the trajectory that we're on. Again, you know, there are things that companies like my, uh, my company, Cisco, can do, things that mm -hmm. Intel and other chip providers can do, even things that the internet companies mm -hmm. who are, you know, essentially the, the champions of your data and the stewards of your data. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to decide the reward and the, re the risk. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to learn by doing. Mm -hmm. uh, here as well, and there's going to be some challenges, right, where we have security breaches. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at what happened with Target. Mm -hmm. um, while their sales might slump or people might change some of their behavior for a period of time, mm -hmm. their reward is still greater than the risk um, because we've learned through that and the chances of it happening like that again at that scale are probably, mm -hmm. you know, a significantly materially lower. Mm -hmm. heart, heart bleed just heart happened. Heart bleed, exactly. Right. And you think, wow, where did this come from? Right. Um, it will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all have to be very smart 
about what we do. Knowing your identity, you know, internally and around your physical circles is going to be as important as knowing your identity online. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people spend a lot of time, maybe on your credit score, but where mm -hmm. else do you really go and look? Right. So that's a that's a whole other industry that will probably take off even more so. So mm -hmm. it is going to be uh, the typical, what we've seen I think over the past 100, 200 years, as the world gets smaller, we're gonna have to balance what the sharing of information provides us. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a perfect answer. Yeah, no, that's- We're gonna it, have to figure it out together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. It is mm -hmm. getting smaller. I communicate with people in other countries every mm -hmm. day that have become friends. Sure. I would consider them friends. If Absolutely. I went and visited, I would want to have lunch with Absolutely. them. Absolutely, how powerful is that? Yeah. The, again, the reward is much uh, yeah. greater than the risk of maybe sharing information or having someone in that government who might not have the same rules as our government right. listening to you. Mm -hmm. So it's a so, balance. And, and there's sensors involved in all mm -hmm. of this. And mm -hmm. the sensors are becoming greater, having greater yes. capacity they are. to help us do these Very things. Very powerful. So tell me a, a little bit about how, how you guys are participating sure. in the sensor well, uh, when you market. Think, when you think about the Internet of Things, that's trying to put sensors and uh, technology deeply embedded into the smallest of things, right? Light switches so you can manage um, electricity usage, you know, in office complex, which, by the way, is 70% of energy consumption. Mm. So offices like these. So mm. if you can balance that, think of the impact you can make on our CO2 footprint and, and everything. All goodness comes from that. Mm. So with our world... I just installed a... Uh Nest? Uh, nest. Yes. L last night. Uh, powerful. I'm Are you really addicted to it? I'm really proud of myself for doing it. I, I can't, I can't, I was like, this is so easy. It's so easy. And I then you get addicted it. looking at it all yeah. the time to say, I'm at 80 degrees. <laughs> I need to come down. I'll be home in a half an hour. Um, you know, in our world, the infrastructure, like all that data is great, but it has to go back into the infrastructure. And all that data has to be turned into some sort of insight or analytics. And that's where the network plays a really big role. So much today of analytics is done back at the data center. Mm -hmm. So if you think about you're at the utmost edge and your desktop is at the edge, and then maybe your office campus, and then you move into a network, and then you go back to a data center. Mm -hmm. What's What we're going to find is there's so much information and data that's going to be created at the edge. Mm -hmm. All that real smart analytics is going to have to move out closer and closer and closer to the edge. Mm. The role of the network becomes even more powerful then. That's a lot of the work that we've been doing at Cisco. How do you take these really big, huge mm -hmm. engines right. that require significant amount of intelligence and capacity in a virtualized environment and start moving that and creating that capability in a set of products that sits even closer to where the data is coming, whether it's you or whether it's a light switch or whether it's another thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's you know a tremendous amount of work that we've been doing at Cisco for five, seven years now. Because mm -hmm. this this is a technology journey and it's really just coming to play mm -hmm. today. But um, you know that's that's our world, pushing that intelligence and analytics out to the edge so that we can do all this stuff.